DM panel. DM panel. DM panel. Yeah, that'll go over swimmingly. Got it. Nail it in one. All right. That's how we roll. 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 Welcome to the Goblins Corner. My name is Eric, and tonight we've got a special little show for you guys. Tonight we have two other Dungeons and Dragons and gaming shows. We've got Mike from 19 Hits the Dragon and Ian from Under Common Taste joining us in the studio this evening. And so for tonight, we're going to have a fun show. We have a list of delightful questions that you, the audience, has written to us over the last year or so. And to be quite frank, we never got around to actually doing anything with them. And so I figured, given the circumstances tonight, we are going to throw together a nice DM panel of three experts, and we're going to answer your questions in the only way we can. So before we get started, of course, if you can, hit the like and subscribe button. Help us get our show out to more people and get notified when more awesome episodes come your way. And of course, if you're listening on iTunes or Podchaser, give us that delightful review because we deserve it. Now, let's get to our our fun panel. Uh, Mike, I'd like you to introduce yourself real quick. Uh, yeah, Eric, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, really glad to be here with you and Ian tonight. Uh, my name is Mike, Mike Daniel. I am the host of 19 Hits the Dragon. Uh, it is a tabletop RPG discussion and interview podcast. Um, I bring people on to talk about tabletop RPGs and offer advice for players and DMs. Um, my guests are always other creators and collaborators within the tabletop RPG community. Um, and yeah, we got a lot of really great interviews and a lot of really great people giving advice and helping me learn how to be a better DM. Absolutely. And welcome to the show. We're always glad to have you. Ian, say a little blurb about yourself, please. Hi, I'm Ian Woodworth. I am one of the co-hosts of Under Common Taste. We are a TTRPG homebrew discussion podcast. We create and discuss homebrew content. Uh, most of our stuff has been Dungeons and Dragons centric. We are uh, in the aftermath of the OGL, uh, deciding to try and branch out a little more. It was always our intention to branch out a little more, um, do some more system agnostic stuff. Um, we have done a, a bunch of homebrew classes, items, uh, talking about building a town in your TTRPG. And uh, one of our biggest, longest running uh, projects that we wrapped up just before episode 100 was uh, the uh, going through the different planes of D&D cosmology. So that was a lot of hours. I don't I don't want to think about how many <laughs> how many hours that was <laughs> um, because, because a lot of really fascinating lore, though, I'll say there's just some really great stuff in there. So yeah. if you're interested in. Um, I, well, Planescape, I guess, really like go and and check those episodes out for sure. I'm, Absolutely, I'm, I'm yeah. still I'm still really excited about the fact that we're gonna get Planescape in 2023. Crossing my fingers, man. It should be. Hope I'm excited. I'm somewhat uh, hesitant as well. So we'll see what happens with you're, all of you're that. You're cautiously optimistic. That's a good word for it. Yes, thank you. So it's interesting you mentioned other games because the first question we've had one of our readers sent us is. What game would you play if you weren't playing D&D, and why? Ian, what do you think about that? What would you play if you were not playing D&D? If, if I had my choice, and I could just corral a group of people and sit them down and say, hey, we're playing this tonight, um, it would probably be the Fallout RPG by Modiphius. Um, I've mm. had it on my shelf for a little over a year. I've been wanting to play it. I love the Fallout franchise. And I just really want to play this game. I just in I am in a place right now where I can't go and make a game somewhere. <laughs> so that that would be the one that I would choose. Um, the actual game that I'm most likely going to play soon that is not D and D, um, because I have a five year old daughter who wants to play, is the My Little Pony Tales of Equestria game <laughs> fantastic i love that she yes. wanted to play it so i picked uh, it up tell me how so it goes we'll, we'll see what what happens with that 
I'm gonna have to get it for my kids now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, give us give give me a review on that, Ian. That's great. Well, I will once I play it. I I love I love all Fallout myself. I think that's a great uh, game to jump into. I'm I'm excited to. I haven't actually played it yet, so I might have to join you when you do run that. That sounds like fun. What about you, Mike? What would you play if you had the opportunity and weren't playing D&D and why? Yeah, so I am actually getting ready to transition my home campaign um, away from D&D to Savage Worlds. I'm really excited about it. It is so, so Savage Worlds as a system is uh, kind of setting agnostic. It can be played in pretty much any setting you can think of or several different settings are out there. Um, so there's the Deadlands is kind of the one of the most popular, which is like Weird West. Um, but there is also space. Deadlands for, is awesome. Yeah, yeah. So Deadlands runs on like the Savage Worlds system, right? Um, but there is, in fact, a uh, like a fan setting that is Eberron, uh, which I'm, as I've mentioned before and on my show many times, um, I'm a big Eberron nerd. Really love the the setting, and uh, yeah, I've been into it uh, for a, a while now. But um, yeah, there's a, a, a setting for Savage Worlds, and I've been getting to know that system and the Savage World system and really excited about it. Um, it's a lot more narrative focused and a lot more customizable from the player's perspective. Uh, you can kind of build mm -hmm. your own character class as you're developing your character, which is super neat. Um, and it's also a little grittier. So like combat is fast and dangerous and it kind of stays that way even after you're you know advancing your character or leveling up so pretty excited about it that's interesting yeah. yeah uh i i really like deadlands i've actually played deadlands i love the the system that they have particularly with casting spells and yeah the using powers yeah, playing yeah. cards and stuff great so cool especially since a mana token just infect you at some point and mm. take over your body <laughs> I'm trying to think of what I would play. We've I've got a couple of answers, which is pretty typical for my brain. But the first one I would say is I've been getting really into kids on bikes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that or not. It's a very simple system. There's only a couple of basic stats, and it's heavily narrative driven, which is, of course, Matt and my MO, right? Because we do predominantly storytelling stuff. And so... I really like the way that they play it. They also have a magic version of that, which is called Kids on Brooms. Yes, I actually have Kids on Brooms. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of Harry Potter-esque, right? But I could easily see that being adapted to pretty much any game with mm -hmm. very little work to it. And uh, so look forward to that, folks, because we're probably going to try to run that on a stream at some point soon. Definitely interested in that. I would also say, if you haven't had the opportunity to play Shadowrun, Shadowrun. Because Chummer, you're deep in the chrome. You're, uh, you know, going against that that megacorp. Look, especially with the way today is going, sometimes you just want to rail against a big corporation and take it down. Hashtag urban renewal. <laughs> yes, urban renewal for the win, my friends. Yeah, for for my money, Cyberpunk Red is an excellent cyberpunk system. The only thing that I kind of yes. miss from that setting is these sort of fantastical races and species and creatures that you can be in like Shadowrun. Shadowrun itself is, I don't know, I, I kind of feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall trying to learn how to play it. So that's just like the setting kicks so much ass, but the game itself is kind of inscrutable at times. So I will say that they have definitely gone through some differences in the rules yeah. over the years and the versions. And some of the versions do things very well and some of them do not. Mm -hmm. They have some challenges. Uh, one of the recent updates, and I haven't seen the 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 brand new version. Uh, I'm, but the last version before that, they had they had Matrix Combat fixed, which was really cool, and it had like a whole bunch of augmented reality and stuff. And I really enjoyed that. I'm interested in reading the newest version. Uh, I think it's probably been out for like a year or two now, at least. But uh, I would definitely run something like that because I again, yeah, like you said, the 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 setting is amazing, right? You know, the awakening. I mean, you got dragons and cyber, you know, cyberware. What more do you <laughs> yeah, want? Absolutely. And it's not a Starfinder game, right? Like, which, by the way, is another great game to play, Starfinder. Shadowrun is one of the few games that I actually do have on my shelf. Uh, the stuff I'll, I have is all Shadowrun 4E. And uh, 
it is part of the stash that I acquired uh, my wife's last ex before we started dating. Uh, basically, he emptied their joint bank account and jumped down. And he left three or four crates of game books at her parents' house. And she decided that he wasn't going to get them back. So I got them instead. So cool. th I, there's a bunch of VTM <laughs> stuff. There's a bunch of uh, Shadowrun stuff, a few other things. Uh, but yeah, that's that's where a lot of my a lot of my library came from. Um, I also have a binder <laughs> of all of his old characters that every so often I pull out as minor villains in my campaigns. Nice. Yeah. Got to make them villainous <laughs> NPCs for sure. <laughs> that is mainly, perfect. Mainly because my wife, it is it is a it is basic the basic rule that I'm only allowed to run a campaign if she is in the game because she mm. wants to play too. And so my wife is always sure. in the party <laughs> fighting against one of his old characters. I love that. Do you make him the mo the monster essentially sometimes? Yeah, there's a, a really great poetic justice to that that's just oh, absolutely I, I never I never make him the the actual villain. He's like one of the, you know, one of the henchmen of the villain. Right. You know, one one of the like not even lieutenants, like one of the sergeants under <laughs> under this big bad. <laughs> this guy's the janitor. <laughs> yeah, you're the janitor of the bad Dungeon guy. Dungeon janitor, the... yeah. Dungeon janitor. Dungeon janitor. This that's great. Oh, that's that's per <laughs> yeah. As you mentioned, Mike, poetic justice, yeah. sir. That's delight. This brings up a great question uh, that someone else wrote. Also, speaking of like monsters and combat and stuff, what is your favorite monster, Mike? What do you think? What do you have? Do you have a favorite monster? Any <sighs> game setting doesn't matter. Yeah, I have too many favorite monsters. Is the problem? Um, I was actually thinking about this question in particular, trying to decide on an answer, and I'm still not there. Um, so I'm going to give two, if that's okay, because that's as far down as I've been able to narrow it. Sure. <laughs> So uh, both D&D &D specific monsters, but um, Mind Flayers, for one, just absolute great villain, villainous monster to, uh, to run. They are smart and incredibly cunning and clever. And there's always going to be like a network of them, right? Like you have one Mind Flayer, yeah. there's many others and an Elder Brain there somewhere. Um, what, what makes, let's, let's analyze okay. that a bit. What makes Mind Flare so devious to you when you run? Yeah, them? so I always like to make, like they always have an agenda that basically boils down to making more Mind Flayers and kind of controlling people, usually from the shadows as well, right? They're kind of puppet masters in a way. Um, so they're not so much interested in direct influence as well i guess like they are directly influencing people who are also doing things on like the surface world or during the daytime right so there's automatically this kind of um like cleverness and deviousness that they have to kind of think around corners essentially um and mm -hmm. the fact that they are basically a hive mind as well so what one mind player knows from its thrall all of the other mind players and the elder brain know so not only is it a like one smart clever individual thinking around corners it is a network of creatures like that that's a good one what's your other one uh, so the other one is kind of the total opposite of the spectrum but still kind of <laughs> creepy um and that is displacer beasts and displacer beasts are always great to throw in an encounter they make an illusion of themselves so the party can you can like make the party think that they're getting ambushed by all of these creatures and then they go to attack and oh it's actually just a you know a handful of them um i also really like the lore behind them as well where they were made by the winter or the unseely fey to uh be kind of the counterpart to blink dogs that the seely or the summer or fey have um mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're just really fun. And you can't hit them big panthers with tentacles. <laughs> exactly. Right. What more can you, what more can you yeah. ask? Yeah, they're great. What about you, Ian? What are what are what is your favorite monster or two? My approach to monsters is very situational. You know, I I I like to to observe what I'm throwing my players into and 
cherry pick what I want that fits the situation. I don't know as if I have a favorite monster. My my favorite class, my favorite archetype of monster is constructs. I love throwing constructs mm-hmm. at my players. Um, of of the constructs, the inevitables are are my favorites. Um, unfortunately, I rarely get a party up to a level where I can actually throw an inevitable at them. <laughs> Yeah, because they'll they'll waste an entire party. Oh yeah, until you're like what mid range or something like that. It depends on whether you're going with like the third edition inevitables or the fifth edition inevitables. Um, the third edition inevitables are nasty. They are, uh, but but I mean they start at I think CR nine. I think I think they started around a CR nine, and uh, and go up from there. But for for low level stuff. Uh, my favorite has to be Sahagen. Sahagen just they they are such an interesting, underutilized humanoid monster that you can get a lot of mileage out of. And you know, everybody talks about how oh, kobolds and pack tactics makes them really, really dangerous, and it does. But the ability that the Sahagen have, where if you aren't at max hit points, they have advantage on that attack. They don't have to do any sort of positioning. Yeah. It's it's like once and once some it's some of them have multiple arms. Yeah. Some of them look like sea elves. Like you know, they might roll up with a with a surfboard and brain you to <laughs> death. Who knows, right? These things are bad badass. We did a we did Matt and I did an episode with uh, kobolds, uh, not kobolds, Sahagen but, and Kuatoa. That's right, yes. And I, I, they're great, man. Throw them into a game. There's nothing like dragging your characters to a watery death. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my most recent campaign started with a shipwreck. So there is a Kraken that is manipulating things to try and open up a portal to the elemental plane of water to bring more Kraken into the world. Um, it was basically, it was the forerunner and when it went through the portal, it found out that there were a bunch of Tritons on the other side that had basically built a fortress around this portal to keep things in. And so it has been slowly building up forces to try and break in and access the portal and get, you know, a free buffet for the rest of the Kraken in the plane of water. <laughs> yeah. And so all of these Sahagan boarded this boat specifically to try to sink it because they're they were doing you know stuff with sea spawn and whatnot and uh they ended up on the beach and they come to with a bunch of sahagan basically combing the beach for survivors and dragging them dragging survivors and corpses off into the ocean and and that's and that's where they woke up to not only are they a great monster mechanically. They're also terrifying. <laughs> they, they just just look at yeah. just looking at the artwork. They are terrifying. They got these big ass teeth. They look like the deep sea fish heads. Almost, yeah. Like yeah. Big the buff English body. Fish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll wreck you, man. I love that. That's a great that's a great answer, man. I like that. Um I would say for myself, I'll do two answers. The first one is one you don't hear much about the wares of flesh, the Sochari. Okay. If you guys remember that, it is a uh, aberration. They look like tendrils and ropes of uh, little filaments. You think the Gua'uld from Stargate SG One? Mm. They get inside your body. They come from a different planet and they seek magic. So they go after wizards and powerful spellcasters and they devour them from within. And eventually, they wear the body out and they got to go find another one. And they can take your spells. And it's so cool because. They're intelligent, they're spellcasting, and they're insidious. And so they are literally the enemy from within. And in fact, one of the campaigns that I've been running uh, in Calumport in Forgotten Realms was taken over by, uh, this group was taken over by the Sochari, and they are trying to basically infiltrate all of high society so that they can start bringing more of their brood over. And so it's a real cool kind of, uh, one part Slither, one part Stargate. Cool story 
behind that. If you want to throw a little paranoia into your characters, have them fight a Sachari. Like, they fight this bad guy, they're just thinking it's some guy. He dies, and then the snake slithers out of his body, and they're like, what the hell is that? Mm. And then it just begins this whole, well, who else do we know that is a Sochari? Could be the shopkeeper that's nice to you and is secretly monitoring your moves, right? A lot of fun with that. I would say the second one is probably going to be the Juggernaut from Shadowrun. I'm just going to go for Shadowrun on that because it's a gigantic armadillo that can, t- get, that can take anti-aircraft fire. <laughs> it's just a big ass armor. The awakened critters in Shadowrun are hilarious. That is a whole series of words that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The other thing, by the way, and they have the other thing you should see is devil rats. Devil rats are also really cool. They're these naked. They're, they're rats that are hairless, but they're evil rats in Shadowrun. And it reminds me very much of, and I got, I know you guys know this, cranium rats yeah. in D anD. d Now they don't. When they get together, they don't all have like a hive mind like the cranium rats, but they're just these mean, oversized rats. Yeah, I'm just still picturing the giant armadillo. It's it's yeah, it's like the size of a tank. <laughs> and it's and it's just it's just a big ass it looks like a cross between an armadillo and an ankylosaurus. If that yeah. puts okay. things into okay. perspective. And it, it yeah, just roams the wild plains of awakened world. Messing stuff up. This is a popular one that people often ask, particularly since uh, we talk a lot about fantasy games and sometimes sci-fi games. Guns or no guns in a fantasy setting? What do you guys think? Let people have guns. Let them have guns. Let people have guns. It's a fantasy game, right? It, time is not the same as the, our time here. You're like, oh, they didn't have uh, revolvers by the time. Of the Look, plate armor is n- more recent than a, than a pistol. Like they also didn't have flying carpets in the real exactly. world either, and yet you're yeah. playing with Thank that. Thank you. So. Thank you. Let people have <laughs> guns. I play in Eberron as well, which is like kind of a little bit more techno- technologically advanced, and I play other games that are you know m- more modern as well. But let people have guns in D anD. D. I feel the same way. What about you, Ian? You feel the same way? Or you uh, you my, have thoughts? my opinion on guns in D anD. D is if they didn't want you to have guns in D anD. D they wouldn't have put stats for guns in the back of the DMG. <laughs> yes. There, there, there is a, there, you go, there, guys. Is a, there is a, a table. I'm wanting to say it's on like page 268 or something like that. It's way in the back and buried, but there is a table with stats mm-hmm. for firearms. Sure. If they didn't want you to play with them. They wouldn't have given you stats for them. <laughs> Exactly. They say it's an optional rule, but you know what else is an optional rule? Every other rule in the game. <laughs> like that is 100% correct. <laughs> you know, hey, in Icewind Dale, the crashed ship, the crashed spelljammer oh, yeah, yeah. ship, there's a ray gun yes, in mm-hmm. that. They've got the stats for a ray yeah, gun. It, I can have a ray gun, but not a pistol. Yeah, in um Water Deep actually, there are uh drow that are um Pistol ears, basically. I can't remember the name for them right offhand, but their whole thing is that they are the drow rank that have guns. So, yeah, let people have guns in D&D. The, the three drow skateers. <laughs> yeah, guns are fun, right? I mean, we already have a wand of magic missile, which basically is a handgun at this point. What's the, the difference? wand of magic missiles is better than a pistol because it never misses. Because it always, <laughs> always <laughs> hits. Yeah, exactly. I can have that, but I can't have a gun that will miss or might blow up on me. Come on. It's totally, totally doable. So there you have it, folks. All three of us agree (laughs) you should have guns in your games. So get to it. Start playing. And besides that, Spelljammer's out. It's it's got GIF and Bombards. Nothing like hippopotamus people showing with flintlock pistols and a bunch of grenades. So go to it. I mean, isn't isn't the artillerist subclass for the artificer you know built around a person with a gun it is like magical right but still it's a gun that they've got yeah it's it's it it either they carry it or it walks around with them but it is a gun now now this brings up an interesting point and i'm pretty sure how you guys are going to answer about this anyway but there is definitely amidst the gaming community a feeling of this realism versus non-realism when you're telling a story Mm. now 
My opinion of this is, and I want to see what you guys think about this, is it depends on your players, first off. It always depends on your players. Because remember, this is collaborative storytelling, first off. But I really don't see a problem if things get wacky to just go with it. Because it's a story. You don't have to be realistic about any of this. First off, rounds are not real anyway. To say that I can do all this in six seconds, I can move and attack and do all that, I could do more or less in real life. This is just a representation of actions for narrative storytelling anyway. So the it's not real argument doesn't really hold a hell of a lot of water. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I am fine with letting games get weird and goofy and unrealistic. I think what is important in terms of realism is character interaction and like the world interacting with itself as long as it feels genuine for the setting for the game for the moment then it's okay it's not unrealistic yeah as as long as the setting is cohesive make it as wacky as you want you know yeah and and and, and that whole you know hyper realism with your setting that is a conversation that you have to have with your players. That is something that you establish from the beginning is like, if you want it to be hyper realistic, if you want it to be very gritty and, you know, real, real world physics and all of this stuff, that's a conversation you have with your players at session zero before you start. You know, that's, that's something, that's something know. that you establish ahead of time because otherwise, you know, if three people are playing it gritty and one person is okay with going wacky, that person is going to go wacky. And then everybody else is going to have a bad time because there wasn't any, you know, establishing of, you know, guidelines here. So my, I guess, I guess my advice is be adults and actually talk to each other. (laughs) Perish the thought. And, and it's funny that you, we have to say that too these days, but yet there's lots of people that don't have those conversations. And then this is what causes bad games, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? This is where we hear these DM horror stories. We're like, yeah, I ran this game and it went off the rails and they didn't have a session zero or as a player, I can't tell you how many players having bad experiences because they didn't know what was going on or they got railroaded by a DM who had an agenda. And that's, that's a terrible thing to think about. And and one of the nice things about a session zero is if you sit down at a session zero and you don't agree on the path that the game should be going from session zero, then you can drop out and find another group and you have zero investment. You have zero reason to stay. Or you can be an adult and talk about it, as you mentioned before. And work something out, and so that everybody's happy, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, can play something everybody some, wants. Sometimes to play. that sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes you have person A who wants to play one kind of game, person B who wants to play another kind of game, and never the twain shall meet. That's okay. Just don't play in the same game together. <laughs> yeah, that's. It, it's kind of my like rule number one. I as a DM or whenever anyone asks me for advice as a DM is just talk to your players and facilitate conversations between players as well. Right. Like get everyone to communicate. If you can communicate well with each other, you can play any game and have a great time. Yeah. That's the, the, the main goal. Right. So yeah, just talk to each other, be adults. (laughs) And even if you're teenagers, learn how to, I don't know, be an adult or whatever, like talk to your friends. It's, yeah, folks, if you're teenagers and you're running this game and you happen to be listening to the show, first off, why? <laughs> and then secondly, if you are still listening to this show, talk it out before you start saying Absolutely. stuff. It's way more fun if everybody's on board with what you're trying to do. And this is regardless of whether you're doing adult themes or if you're doing just a regular dungeon crawl, right? Or playing, again, like playing sci-fi games like Travelers or something like that, right? It's you know, I, I likened it to uh, if I if I came over to to somebody's house, we were going to watch a movie 
and they end up playing like Teletubbies on the TV. And I'm like very <laughs> disturbed by this because like, why are we watching Teletubbies? Right. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, I decided we we're going to watch this. I thought we were going to watch like a movie movie. And they're like, oh, we're going to watch this Teletubby marathon. Now I'm upset because you didn't communicate with me. So don't be that person, folks. Let's talk a bit about, uh, let's, let's change it up a little bit. What is the best character voice you've ever done in a game? First off, do you do character voices in I, games? I, I do, but they tend to all blend together. <laughs> <laughs> that That's fine. I tend to, for myself, rather than try to do like a voice as a, as a voice actor would and kind of put on something else, I will try to like change my inflection and tone a little bit um, just mm -hmm. to kind of convey the sort of the personality of this person, um, usually. Um, I did recently start a um, an actual play that may or may not continue um, with things as they stand with the Watsi. But um, yeah, I uh, for that, I have a character who has an Irish accent and it's a lot of fun. It's my cool. first time like really committing to that accent for a whole game. So we'll see how it goes. I love a good accent. Yeah. It's fun in a fantasy world, too, because mm -hmm. you can make up whatever you want, and it's, that's the accent. I think my favorite, my favorite voice that I've ever done was for the most recent character that I actually played, which is my, my kobold monk. His name is Xing Fui. Uh, yeah. Xing Fui. And uh, he's missing all of the teeth on the left side of his face due, due to a... Uh, an unfortunate blunt force trauma accident. Um, so he talks with a little bit of a lisp, and so that's mm. that's the voice that I came up with for him. I love that. I, yeah, I got a I got a fairy dragon named Marmalade that talks a lot <laughs> like that. Hey guys, it's really I'm really excited about what you adventurers mm. go. It's easier for me to just not close that side of my mouth and talk out of it. Go with what works too. That's that's always a fun thing, right? Like it's it's it. it Doing character voices isn't like something that you have to do. It doesn't have to be hard. You know, it can just be as you, as what Mike mentioned. It could just be an inflection mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, I sometimes like I got this uh, intelligent dagger uh, that has the soul of a dragon in it that one of my characters has in their game. Nice. And I just basically speak like an asshole to mm -hmm. all of the characters when he talks. It's just like, yeah. you know, all of you are going to your death worms. <laughs> Obviously, none of you are going to be listening to me. So just die, worms. I am immortal now. And and that's all they do. And every now and then he speaks up and they get all pissed off at him. Um, I did get myself in trouble one time by doing a funny voice for a goblin snurt um, in the... What's the Giants campaign? Uh, Storm um, King's Thunder? Storm King's Thunder, yes. Yeah, it was a... a a goblin that was stuck in the fat folds of the hill giant uh queen or whatever her status is um and not a great place to be when you're stuck in the fat yeah, folds absolutely or maybe but, it was a great place yeah, to be who well, knows the, the party pulled him out because he was holding also holding on to a magic item that she had tucked in there but uh yeah i gave him a was, i'm i'm smart i'm i'm i don't please don't hurt me Right. And uh, the party just like absolutely loved that that voice that I just kind of pulled out of my ass. And then they decided to keep Snart around and like adopt him, basically. So I had to keep <laughs> keep that voice up for the entire campaign when I was just uh, one off of, and got, got kind of good at it. That's that's the problem with with doing voices. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. You never know when the when your players are going to love it and then you're going to have to do it forever. Yep. So that's always kind of fun. Uh, this is a fun one. What environment have you never played a game in? So we talk a lot about terrain and environment and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you've probably played, I don't know if you guys have ever played Dark Sun, for example, which is, you know, blasted wasteland in the desert. Have you, is there an environment that you guys have never played? Is there one that you want to play? One that I haven't done, surprisingly, is a, uh, like an, a, an adventure at sea. Or even like from a, a at a coast that goes out in you know oh, the, the I recommend a pirate. Yeah, game, I've my never friend. done a pirate game. Surprisingly, it's kind of the one thing that I haven't done. I've done space. I've done uh, like all across. We got all a few minutes left in this. Like, we can start one yeah, up. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Give, give me a call. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and kind of going back to the question about a game 
that we would like to play is Seventh C. I've heard is really good for uh, pirate adventure. Seventh C is really cool. Yeah, I love that. What about you, Ian? I've never done an urban campaign. I really want to do an urban campaign. Just you know, a like a a campaign that happens entirely in like a mega city to where you can get all of the different things wherever you want to go and still be completely urban. And I mean, not even, you know, whether this would be a, a fantasy game like D and D or in a, in a different game, like cyberpunk red or shadow run mm-hmm. or something like that. I don't really care. I just, I, I, I want that concrete jungle game going on. I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd actually, I'd love to do that using the Fallout RPG and do it in a ruined city. You know, pandering to my co-hosts here, do it in Chicago or in Atlanta or, you know, mm-hmm. you know some some place that maybe isn't established fully in in Fallout lore, just, just mm-hmm. so that I don't have mm-hmm. to you know, I don't have to make sure that all of the bits and pieces from the video games make it into my table game. That's pretty cool. That's a great idea. I definitely say if you want to do a fantasy uh, game with cities, Ravnica isn't bad to start with. Um, If you're going to put, and you know, Planescape's coming out soon. I'm assuming they're going to have Sigil or Sigil in there, depending Mm. on how you pronounce it. You say, potato i say according to according to the book the second edition book it is pronounced sigil if you're a prime it's sigil if if you're you know if you're a clueless prime it's sigil if you're (laughs) if if you're in on the uh if you're in on it then it's sigil Sigil is the place a sigil is what you use when like you're doing magic right yeah very true very different things (laughs) um yeah also again i will plug for uh, an urban campaign, um, Eberron, the city of Sharn, is a yes. fantastic uh, location. Sharn is great yeah. because it's it's got multiple levels and tiers and stuff like yep. that. I would also say if you're playing uh, Starfinder, Absalon Station is a mm. great space base to play in. It's lots of fun. So I would recommend that if you want to play like a sci-fi fantasy style game. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I haven't done a lot of like wilderness games mostly because wilderness is usually like getting from point a to point b mm-hmm. done a lot like i've done some tundra games i've done a lot of under dark crawls i've done some city games and stuff like that but i would say like just where maybe you're just isolated from society yeah a survival game would be dope i was when you're you're mentioning that i was just thinking about uh chult just being yeah out in chult you don't even necessarily have to chult? play you know the tomb of annihilation right you can just kind of use chult as a setting as is and uh to get that jungle setting would be neat i i think also would be kind of neat too is to run maybe like a deep forest like a canadian wilderness campaign Mm -hmm. in world of darkness because particularly like the new version of the world of darkness it's pretty grim you're just there's just there's just horror out in the woods and you might maybe we play a bunch of vampires, which are city folk, and they're <laughs> lost in the woods, and there's werewolves stalking them. I think I think that would actually be a good one for Werewolf the Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah, that I mean that goes without saying being the hunters, but I think it'd be more fun for the players to be hunted, <laughs> which would be yeah. a lot more fun. You'd just be like, oh man, I'm I'm used to just drinking blood in a city and getting it on tap, and now I have to hunt for my own food, and there's these monsters that are out seeking our death. Expanding on that a little bit, have two groups running simultaneously. One is <laughs> Sabbat, the other is Camarilla. And they have, so they're contending with one another while trying to survive in the wilderness. That would be fun. Mm. Another option is to have two groups of players, one playing the werewolves and the other one's playing that the would be good, yeah. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun to play. And then at the end, you just mix them all yeah, together. Yeah, just have one big finale with the, the whole whole gang. That would be good for like a living so world. So give uh, what, what, if I were to do that, I would have my, my experienced players, my experienced party playing the vampires and my newbie party playing the werewolves so that the newbie party gets to learn how the system works. 
from a from a position of advantage. This would be a great way to run a campaign where you have two DMs. Like if you've seen like the Living City yeah. games and stuff at cons and stuff mm-hmm. where you like one side of the table is one side of the city and the other side of the table is on the other side of the city and you have a game master in the woods like one part is designated the woods and the other is designated like the log cabin or whatever or maybe just another part of the woods and one game master runs the the vampires and the other one runs the werewolves and they just kind of play them back and forth for a while and then there's like this one lone mage that is just messing everyone up <laughs> completely altering the reality around them and it's just like ha 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 this is all my master get a, plan get a couple of changelings that bounce back and forth between tables mm. Bunch of pissed off, uh, risen spirits that that infect the nearest body. And come back. We've made a deal. We're coming <laughs> <Yes>. back. <laughs> we, be a lot we of have fun. The best ideas. Just saying, it's true. It's true, folks. You need to play some of these ideas and tell us about it, please. And if you can, if you haven't yet, feel free. Hit us up at Goblin's Corner on Twitter, or you can hit us up on Mastodon because Twitter is a dumpster fire. Now let's jump into a different thing, which is kind of similar to what we're talking about anyway, so I think this is a good segue. How do you effectively demonstrate or storytell a fight scene? Like if you were to tell someone who is just starting out as a DM or GM, storyteller and such, what would you give them in terms of a couple of pointers to effectively do a good fight scene? Because they are tough to run, particularly if you've never done it before. I would, I would start off, especially if you're using a system like D&D. Not every hit in combat should be described as a mortal wound. If that goblin shoots you with an arrow, that arrow doesn't necessarily just suddenly stick in your shoulder. You know, arrow glancing off, hit like hitting you and glancing off, that is still going to hurt like a son of a bitch. But you don't have the, okay, now I'm running around. I'm still at three quarter health, but I have an arrow lodged in my shoulder. And yet somehow I'm still able to function completely normally in combat. So that's, that's, yeah, that is something that I do is I, I try to make sure that if I'm, if I start inflicting mortal wounds, that is my indication that whatever you're hitting is getting really low on hit points. Yeah, for sure. I I think bouncing off of that is just to focus on those bumps and bruises and small cuts and scrapes rather than the big hits, right? I think uh, that's a, a one thing that I really like to do is borrowing from fourth edition actually is give things the bloody condition. So once they're under half HP, yeah that's the first time that blood is drawn on them. Anything else up to that point has been a close call or damaged them in some way that is not drawing blood, you know, hitting them hard to, you know, make some bruises or small cuts, stuff like that. But um, anything, any large slashes are going to be once they're at half health, for sure. Another kind of tricky thing with combat is keeping the tension up. Mm-hmm. I, I think any sort of game where you're going to have like an initiative order and combat rounds and things kind of happening in a specific, you know, you go and then you go and then you go, right, is keeping the uh, the tension sustained from turn to turn, especially when people are having to like think about what they're doing or whatever. So um, as a DM, I kind of like to do a little narrative handoff as I'm going in initiative order. So. All right, great, Ian. I like that. You just took, uh, you know, a, a big hit from this goblin as he smacked you with his uh, his club. And, um, you know, this, these other goblins are kind of rushing the party. Eric, it's your turn. What are you doing now? Right. You know, Eric takes his turn, hits the goblin. Great. Uh, Ian, you're, you're up. What are you doing next? Right. Like having that narrative carry into the next turn helps it feel like the story is continuing and keeping that that tension up. Absolutely. So I love both of your answers because we've got describing wounds, describing the combat, and then basically what you're saying, Mike, is recapping so that everybody is on board with the same kind of thing. Because it's easy to forget what everybody else is Mm -hmm. doing. I'm going to jump in and say, because you guys have said two great things, I'm going to say environment is another thing that, that you definitely need to talk about in combat. 
describe the scene. And we're, what we're talking about anyway, if you've noticed or if you folks are listening, is describe what's going on because if you've got more than two people, which most games have, then they're going to be focused on what they're doing and they're not going to remember. And you're going to hear a lot of questions about, okay, where is so-and-so? Who is he or she fighting, right? That type of stuff is because they're not understanding that mental picture, even if you've got figures on a board, right? We play with, I play with Roll20 a lot or uh, Foundry or even like physical stuff when people show up. And even then, they're, not, they're kind of confused about what's going on in the scene. And so describing the environment, where people are, and the action that's happening around them is vitally important as a storyteller to get that tension that Mike mentioned and to get that understanding of whether someone is wounded or if someone is ready to just keep slaying. I think those are great answers. And, that, and that's easy to start with, right? Just over-describe a little bit. And properly describing your environment opens up the door for improvisation because mm -hmm. yes. some of the best encounters that I've had have res resulted from my players interacting with their environment. If you could get them to comment about what's going on in a scene or a combat, you have done your job as a storyteller. If you affect them, yeah, and you know the rogue's right? not going to use the chandelier to swing across the room if you don't tell them that it's there. So, that's right. They got to have that chandelier, folks. <laughs> so, like, I think, I think one of my one of the, my favorite examples of this was from uh, Critical Role near the early on in uh, Campaign Three. Um, so, mild spoilers if you're not caught up. But they're they're down in the bottom of this mine fighting this monster, and Lemo Brand's character Orem has the the rope. Was it the rope of ens ensnaring the animate rope? He manages to ensnare the big bad with one end of the rope, and then he feeds the other end of the rope into this piece of mining equipment to to bind it up and pull and basically suck the big bad in to restrain them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that, that that is one of my one of the more recent and so it's it's fresh on the brain uh examples that i can pull for you know using the environment to facilitate an effect in combat that you purely can't with just your normal arsenal of weapons and spells we've got one final question for this evening and uh, i think this is always a fun one we, one of our listeners wrote in, you have a flock of seagulls and a murder of crows. What is a group of gaming nerds called? It's a conflict. A conflict of gaming nerds. I, uh, I find that delightful. <laughs> because anyone, yeah. because yeah. anyone who has ever tried to schedule a game. Yeah. It's like scheduling, scheduling a herd of cats. It, scheduling is the, uh, the highest CR creature in all of TTRPGs. So. That's 100% true. Um, yes. What about you, Mike? What do you uh, think? I'm honestly, I'm having trouble coming up with some something better than conflict because that's just so good. Um, <laughs> how do we make a collective noun for murder hobo? Um, you have a a, a murder hobo can of players. No, 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 no. A hobo group a of yeah. gamers. A box car. Box car. <laughs> a box car. There you go. I'm going to go for something a little different. I'm going to say a flump of gamers. Flump. That's right. Because a flump of... I've, yeah. I've determined to use the word flump as nouns, verbs, and adjectives from this point <laughs> forward. Flump of gamers. It is, it awesome. is definitely a more socially appropriate F word. It's one, it is my second favorite F word to use, in fact. Yes, flumping. So there you have it, folks. A couple of answers to your delightful questions. I really appreciate everybody sending stuff in and of course if you ever want to ask us a question hit us up at goblins corner on twitter or of course you can hit us up on mastodon and all the social media channels mike and ian thanks so much for being on the show mike if you can uh where can more interested folks find you uh yeah you can find me anywhere you get your podcast 19 hits the dragon um and on social media twitter tumblr mastodon and uh tiktok a little bit as well um, you can find me 19 hits the dragon, all one word, any social media platform, uh, except Instagram. I'm not there yet, but I guess we'll, maybe we'll work on that. One. But yeah. It's all influencers yeah. anyway. 
Uh, Ian, what about you? Where can we, where can interested folks find you as well? Uh, your the show? show Under Common Taste. We are on every platform that podcasts are hosted on. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Twitch at Under Common Taste. Uh, on Mastodon at Under Common Taste at Dice Dot Camp. Um, on Twitter at UCT Homebrew. Um, mainly because Undercommon Taste was too many characters, and I did not want to be at Undercommon Taste. There you go right there. Thanks for, so much for joining us. And of course, please hit like and subscribe on the almighty algorithm. Hit us up with uh, five stars on iTunes and Podchaser. Once again, my name is Eric. Uh, my name is Mike. And I'm Ian. And we'll see you next time. Goblin's Corner has been written and produced by Eric Holden and Matt Staples. Music by D20. This is a subterranean production.